the shooting range. In this episode, we take a look at the renewed Eel 28 modification. Shh! It's not one ship, it's a whole family of hero ships. We recall the story of the MO4 boats. Hotline, the developers answer question that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with what to do if you've got more than one turret. Designers of the armored vehicles during the interwar period worked according to a simple principle. One turret is good, but two is better. Tanks with two turrets were supposed to break through the defensive lines, firing from cannons and machine guns all over the place. And really, this construction allowed for significant increases of firepower, as well as the cost, manufacturer complexity, weight, etc. Anyway, by the beginning of the Second World War, the subject of multi-turreted tanks was closed for good. But in War Thunder, the situation is different. All the non-combat disadvantages of such machines simply don't matter here. Therefore, today we will discuss how to fight on these land-based cruisers. And a small disclaimer before we begin, we only consider vehicles that have at least two turrets armed with cannons. That means that machines like the five-turreted A1E1, independent, are not the case here. Almost every nation in the game has multi-turreted tanks. Only the French and Italians have to do without them for now. All these machines are very different, but they still have a couple of things in common. Firstly, Accept the fact that almost none of these tanks will satisfy you in terms of speed and maneuverability. You have two options here. Embrace it and go to the realistic battles or test your luck in the arcade mode, where the speed is much more pleasant, as well as acceleration dynamics. The second common feature is that it's really difficult to shoot with these machines. A simple example. Here is an enemy facing us. Let's aim and fire from all the guns, as that's how they are configured by default. And we only get one hit. How's that? Because it would be odd to expect a 76mm cannon to have the same ballistics as a 45mm one. So, first things first. Go to the settings and set the commands for switching between your guns the way you see more comfortable. For example, we've chosen a combination of the left control with the F2, F3 and F4 keys for the main gun, the secondary one and everything altogether respectively. The latter one is useful in close combat, where the difference in ballistics doesn't matter. The last important feature of the multi-turreted tanks is that they are robust as hell. And it's not about the armor, which isn't very thick on most of them. It's about the number of crew members. For example, the SMK has seven tankers inside and the T-35 a whole ten of them. In reality, these machines were a dead-end branch of the tank industry. But in War Thunder, all these land-based cruisers got a new life. So, which multi-turreted tank do you like most? Tell us in the comments. The Il-28 Shh looks a lot like the base model. Same speed, same engine, same bombs. But there are still some differences. Let's talk about those. The Il-28 of the Sh version received new toys to help destroy ground targets. There are six S-24 rockets as well as containers with four G-23 guns 
and a crazy amount of 192 S5K rockets. And you can carry bombs as well. Though you'll have to choose. The payload restrictions don't allow you to carry bombs and rockets at the same time. Let's take a closer look at the new items. To begin with, the S24 rockets. In skillful hands, they can sow real horror among the enemy, especially since each of these beauties launches separately. True, there are also disadvantages. For an effective launch, you'll have to enter the enemy AA gun range. So first, make sure of the safety of such a maneuver. And of course, remember that the external containers affect your flight performance. The changes aren't critical, but still notable. Maximum speed is 25 kph lower, climb rate is also 3.6 meters per second lower, and you get an additional 2.6 seconds delay in turn time. The next novelty is the S5K rockets. There are almost no explosives inside, so they can only harm the target with a direct hit of the shaped charged jet. The penetration rate isn't huge, only 150 millimeters at all distances. But if you fire a volley of these rockets to the side or the top of the enemy, you'll be quite able to hit him. And if you remember that you have as many as 192 rockets, wow. But there are problems as well. Firstly, for an effective launch, you have to be at least 1.5 kilometers from your target way into the AA gun's range. And still, the low penetration rate and low accuracy of the rockets force you to take a lot of risks. You can destroy the enemy, but you'll sweat for it, that's for sure. Secondly, all this giant ammunition is placed in 12 external containers that greatly affect your performance. With these missiles, you lose as much as 163 kph from the maximum speed and gain almost 6 meters per second to the climb rate and almost 3 seconds to the turn. As for the four G-23 guns, we'll leave them alone for now. This kit will be effective against the enemy helicopters, but it's better to forget about ground targets with it. All in all, this is the good old Eel 28, but with three new weapon sets that noticeably increase the flexibility of this machine. Got into a battle where the enemy doesn't have a top AA gun with radar? Fine, take the rockets and go. The opponents have closed the sky? Okay, climb higher and drop a well-known three-ton bomb FAB 3000. The helicopters are circling above? Well, you get the idea. In addition, in arcade aviation battles, you'll be able to fly another bomber with identical characteristics and without spending your backups. As for the combat use, in AB, you'll be swell bringing death to ground enemy tech with your rockets and guns. And if somebody dares attacking you in the sky, put him on your tail and ground from the turrets. The twin NR-23 cannons can perfectly cope with anyone who wants to shoot you down. In RB, better switch to bombs. Although, if you really want to fly over the enemy base with a couple of rockets, who are we to stop you? And in mixed battles, well, it all depends on your skills and the situation on the battlefield. Midges are quite bothersome insects that can cause a lot of trouble. That was very well known to the ships and aircraft of the Third Reich. Today, we recall the story of the Soviet MO4 motorboats. MO in Russian language stood for Malia Achotniki, which means the small hunters. 
They were also known as Moshki, which means the midges, because it was a perfect description for a ship of a mosquito fleet and also because of simple linguistic reasons. The construction of the MO4 is a fine example of the friendship between military engineering and soldiers' savvy. Despite the modest sizes, the midges had heating, ventilation and sleeping places for each crew member. The armament wasn't bad either. Two 45mm guns and two heavy caliber machine guns. And then, after the cannon had already begun, someone from the brainy sailors, who clearly envied the glory of the Katyushka, suggested to install the same famous rocket launcher system on these ships. The proposal was accepted and the MO4 became almost the first Soviet missile boat. Plus, three diesel engines gave it a good speed and excellent seaworthiness, up to six points of the Sea State Code. Ultimately, they've created a good small ship with the capabilities for landing operations and mine planting, as well as for anti-aircraft and anti-submarine defense. So, it's not at all surprising that they've built a total of more than 250 of the MO4s. Their first encounters happened during the Winter War, but the hard work came when World War II began. The small but very handsome shells from the MO4's 45mm cannons had already had their first date with the German bombers on June the 22nd during the raid of Sevastopol and in general, all other cities where these small hunters were deployed. Then began the painstaking everyday work until the very end of the war. The Soviet command was very reluctant to engage large ships in the operations, so while the Marat battleship stood still at the dock wall and waited for the encounter with the fateful bomb, the Mosquito fleet had to carry the burden of the military operations on its own. Okay, with a little help from the Soviet submarines. Twenty-two of the small hunters were involved in the withdrawal of the Soviet fleet from Tallinn. Following a narrow fairway among the mines, the boats covered convoys from German aviation and rescued people from sunken ships for three days. There, the MO204 boat got saved by a drowning man. The cadet Vinogradov, trying to climb on board the ship, suddenly saw a mine in the water, grabbed it with his bare hands and pushed it away, after which the hero was safely rescued. After that, the MO4 ships from the Baltic fleet put mines, fought the Luftwaffe, and delivered food to the besieged Leningrad from the Great Land. At the same time, they sank two German submarines using depth charges. Uh, didn't they see any no trespassing signs or anything? And on the Black Sea, the midges were much more active because the local waters were not so heavily mined. There, these universal ships defended Odessa and Sevastopol repelled endless air raids and transported troops. In October 1941, 34 of the MO4 class ships took part in the evacuation of troops from Odessa. When they realized that they were losing Sevastopol too, guess who evacuated the commanders and party workers from the city? Ships with a crew of only 16 people somehow managed to take up to a hundred passengers on board. At the same time, the losses among the MO boats were surprisingly small. It turned out that they were great survivors and managed to stay afloat even after taking serious damage. In 1943, the SKA 065 motorboat, protecting a transport from German aviation, received about 200 small splinter damages. The boat had a broken forestem, damaged engines, cisterns, pipes, the deckhouse, and its nose plunged in the water. But it still managed to start an engine and catch up with the transport on its own. The MO4s proved their best qualities as landing ships 
after their duties shifted from defense to liberation operations, landings on the Kerch and Taman peninsulas, and, of course, the Novorossiysk landing operation. The MO boats were everywhere. They fought aircraft, transported troopers, and even conducted artillery duels against the German coastal defense. At the end of the war, when the enemy was no longer touchable using the 45mm cannons, the MO4s were tasked with the last honorable mission, to guard the Yalta Conference. There, they completed their combat path. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline, developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a user called Sir Godzilla. Just had a good time at the Australian House Armour Fest and rode in a Soviet T-72 while I was there. And a thought came to my mind. Do you partner up with tank collectors for events or anything? I honestly would love to see you guys do an event with the guys here in Down Under. Hi mate. We have some connections with collectors from all over the world, but mostly we contact them to get some information on the tech that we want to add in the game. As for the events, that's a whole different subject. We'll think of that, but can't promise you anything for now. Then there's another question coming from Tony Redgrave. More about Otto Carius? For others who haven't read Tigers in the Mud. Hi there. We'll look into that and see what our Department of Pages of History can dig up. Sam Smith asks, Will you ever add a modern tanks like the Amada? Hi there, Sam. In general, yes, we already announced that we're going to get the modern tanks at some point. As for the Amata specifically, inside this one there is some top secret, super modern, high quality, deadly stuff that no one would give us the information about. So, for now, we're concentrating on a more disclosed tech. And the very last, very serious message is from Calbreno. Give a sub so he gets it. What? Who? <laughs> oh, him. Well, let him get it. Don't like him anyway. Well, that's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.